We're going to give it about uh, 15, 15 to 30 seconds. Just wait for uh, folks to get on the line. Hello, I am uh, Colonel Michael Greenberg, Garrison Commander. I'm joined by Captain Cindy uh, Judy, the Hospital Director. Uh, welcome to the sixth uh, virtual town hall. Uh, thank you very much for listening to us weekly. Uh, we appreciate this opportunity to give you the, the latest updates that we have and then try to answer any concerns or questions that you have. T today I'm gonna I'm gonna give some updates. I'm gonna turn it over to Captain Judy to give some updates and then we'll answer some of those questions that were unanswered last week and try to answer some questions that have popped up today. So first off, uh, I know over the last month we've experienced a number of changes uh, across the installation. And some have been uncomfortable to include the face coverings, the social distancing, gate hours, youth curfew, and, and others. Uh, but I ask you to, to, to adhere to these policies and remain vigilant in your actions across the installation. Again, our number one priority is to protect our people, that's our families, our service members, our workforce, uh, and those that, that use uh, Fort Belvoir. So again, for safety, health, and welfare, I ask you please adhere to these policies. One of the ones I want to address is requiring the face coverings in all high traffic areas. Again, one that we've implemented, I appreciate the support. Um, I understand that people uh, don't like to wear them at all times. Uh, but I, I am telling you the face covering policy is that we are requiring face coverings in the exchange, commissary, shop beds, post office, CDCs, ID card facilities, food establishments, those areas that we cannot maintain six feet, and the hospital. Um, you're not allowed in those facilities or to shop in those facilities unless you have the face coverings. Again, this is not just for your safety, but this is for the safety of you and all those in the community. This is one of those additive measures that we could do across the installation uh, to really prevent uh, the spread of this virus. And so please, I ask you to, uh, to use those. I know there's been some questions about the proper way of, of wearing it and enforcing the standards. So again, I ask you to cover both your nose and your mask uh, when you're wearing those face coverings. I do have a courtesy patrol that is going out and, and helping enforce that standard. Uh, I ask if, they, if they, they see you and they make a correction, uh, please do not talk back to them. Acknowledge, make the correction, and, and move on. Um, I know for, for some, you, especially the workers out there that are wearing the face coverings for long hours of the day, you know, if you need time or you need a break, please talk to your supervisor. Uh, I would rather you go out and take a break in your car or outside the building, uh, then try to take it halfway down your face or go into a back room uh, and, and try to take a break there without the face covering. So again, I, we talk with leaders across the installation, uh, advise them that that's the best practice is to allow uh, our employees that work on the installation to take a break when needed outside. The next I want to address is large, large gatherings. And I understand that people are getting fees, uh, cabin fever right now, and they're, they really want to go out and, and gather. However, again, social distancing is, is another measure that is, is really one of our main efforts in being able to stop the spread of the virus. So again, for the safety and health of everyone, I ask you to abide by the social distancing protocols. Again, what's come up in Facebook several times is, you know, how do we enforce it? What are we doing? So I told you we have some courtesy patrols going out to the facilities. Uh, if you have an issue outside in the villages or on the installation, you, know, you can always contact DES non-emergency phone number. But I would tell you, if you see something, say something. Uh, I, I charge the parents out there who have children who aren't abiding by it, that the, the parents should be responsible for those children. Um, again, if you see something, say something. Uh, and, and again, if you're walking down the road and you don't live with the person, uh, then the policy is you can't maintain six, six feet. Please put on your face coverings. 
Next, I want to address uh, one of our, we, we talked a little about a, a, a CDC employee that was positive tested and what we did on the installation back a couple of weeks ago. Um, today I want to discuss, we did have a positive case at the exchange, one of the exchange uh, workers. And so again, I want to be transparent and talk to you a little bit about that, uh, that incident or that event. So on, uh, on Thursday night, an individual, uh, thir uh, in, on Thursday, an individual wasn't feeling good, uh, went to the hospital on Friday morning, uh, was tested on Friday morning, did not come to work Friday through Sunday. The test results came back on Sunday. Uh, it was a positive test. Uh, what I want to tell you is there's a lot of lessons learned and a lot of great things that we did in that incident to protect the community. Um, and so first, the employees and, and all employees, that employee specifically, was wearing a face covering his entire day on, uh, on Thursday when he was at work. And so again, containing, containing that, uh, he, went, he did not expose a lot of the post-exchange. Um, two, on Sunday, once we got the information, we immediately, we immediate, uh, actually the post-exchange immediately contacted us, um, and then we immediately contacted the hospital. But thanks to the hospital, we did tracing of that individual that day on Sunday. We made all the notifications and it was very limited, uh, which was a good thing. Uh, we also closed immediately down uh, those three areas that were affected uh, where that individual was um, during, his, during his work hours. Uh, and so that was done immediately. We communicated out to the workforce, the AFI's workforce uh, as well. Uh, and then Monday, we, we modified hours of, of the post-exchange. We, we went in, we did a full cleaning, professional cleaning uh, on Friday night, and, uh, and then resumed operations on, on Tuesday. Uh, so again, lessons learned, face coverings, being transparent, expedited tra tracing uh, by the hospital and notification, uh, and, then, and then doing a, a cleaning. Next, I want to talk about transition uh, and what the new norm is. And so people have asked me, well, what does is, what is the new norm look like? And so I've told them, that's great. I, I can't answer that question right now because we don't know what the new norm looks like. We at the Garrison are working in conjunction with the hospital, um, looking at you know the White House task force guidance, uh, looking at state and local guidance as well and coming up with what our transition plan is and what our activities look like, what our CDC looks like, uh, what our barbershops are gonna look like, and, and everything else that we do around the installation. But we're working on that plan. I wanna introduce the concept during this town hall, because uh, I know there will be questions that come up over the next couple weeks on what that new normal looks like. Uh, but again, it will be coming. It's not coming next week. Okay, so next week at this time, unless something significantly changes, we're gonna, the, the norm is gonna be what we are right now. Okay, and, and everyone knows, you know, the governor put out the stay at home uh, through the middle of June. And so we have at least some time uh, before that, that comes out of effect unless the governor changes that order. But again, it'll be fact-based, it'll be science and, and data, it'll be advice um, across the enterprise from not just uh, outside the installation, but from the hospital. Um, and then once those are made, again, I ask you to abide by those new norms. Uh, and we will be as transparent and, and honest and, and forthcoming in advance to make sure people are prepared uh, for what that new norm looks like. Uh, Virginia right now is, is maybe at its peak, but maybe not yet. And so again, we do have more days at hand um, to see cases across Virginia, Maryland, and, and D.C. area, uh, and then we are working the transition plan forward. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about before I hand it over to Captain Judy is, is just re-putting out the safety message I put out last week. Again, we, we do have a, a aircrafts uh, on our field that MDW has pre-positioned there. I ask once again to avoid that area. Uh, the helicopters are operational and are not for public display. So for your safety precautions, please do not go on the parade field uh, because again, those, those are operational and are doing, uh, doing training missions. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Captain Judy for a hospital update. Hey, thanks sir. So, you know, I always like to start it off with a few thank yous from folks on base. 
Um, so I'll start it off with, uh, yesterday was Admin Professionals Day, right? Our administrative uh, professionals are the front lines of this community, and they're the behind the scenes professionals of this community, and without their support, we wouldn't be able to keep DOD and the federal governments running. And so I just wanted to do a shout out for our administrative professionals throughout the Fort Belvoir installation for all that they do. I know many of them are doing some telework, but some of them are still coming um, in person to their jobs. So thank you for that. Um, the second one is April is the month of the military child, and so I just want to uh, recognize all of our amazing military kids on this base. Um, and that live in the, Fel the Fort Belvoir outlying communities as well. And uh, thank all of the services that support them. But let's not forget that it's the month of the military child. <clears throat> and then finally, um, April is Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month. And I know that there's a lot going on um, throughout this pandemic, but protecting the forces and protecting the mission remain a priority. And so I, I just want to thank the SARCs, the victim advocates, and all of the leadership that continue to support that very important program that protects our force and our mission. This week at the hospital um, is National Medical Laboratory Professionals Week. Uh, so I want to recognize our laboratory professionals and pathologists across the military health system. Year-round, they provide critical capability, but their efforts to get results to providers in this fight against COVID is pretty spectacular. Um, their tireless work is making a difference to our patients. So thanks to all of those, those lab professionals out there. I have a few questions, actually quite a few questions, but since it's lab week, I'll start with the lab ones. Uh, the first one is, my COVID-19 test came back negative, so why do I have to continue to quarantine or wear a mask? So if you test negative for COVID, you probably were not infected at the time your nasal swab uh, specimen was collected, but we cannot be 100% sure, okay? A negative test does not always mean that a person is not infected with the virus. In fact, if somebody's tested really early when they have the virus, it may not come back positive, or if there just wasn't a good specimen in that swab, um, then they might come back negative, and that would be a false negative, right? So someone could test positive later, or the patient could be exposed after the test and develop the illness with a negative test, providing sort of a false sense of security. So it's important that um, we complete quarantine periods and we continue to practice social distancing, hand washing, and wearing of those uh, cloth face coverings in accordance with CDC guidance. The next question, there's a lot of information in the media regarding antibody treatment for COVID-19. Is that available at Fort Belvoir? Um, sort of is the answer for that. The Armed Services Blood Program is currently looking for people who have fully recovered from COVID-19 to give convalescent plasma for seriously ill coronavirus patients. Um, convalescent plasma is the liquid part of the blood that's collected from patients who have fully recovered from the infection. Antibodies present in convalescent plasma are proteins that might help in the fight against coronavirus. While there's no approved treatment for this disease at this time, there is information that suggests it might help some patients recover from COVID-19. To be eligible to donate, you have to be at least 17 years old and weigh at least 110 pounds, be in good health and feeling well, have a prior diagnosis of COVID-19 that meets specific lab criteria with a positive test, and then be symptom-free for at least 14 days prior to donation. So this is a research protocol that's going on. It's the Armed Forces, um, uh, the Armed Services Blood Program in conjunction with Walter Reed, and so they are doing some of that. That's a lot of information that I just put out there. I'm gonna show this to you. I got a lot of feedback that this was helpful. If people know what to look for on the Facebook page and on the website, they'll know where to go. So if, if, if you've tested positive and you wanna, um, and you wanna make a donation of convalescent plasma, that's the uh, icon to look for on those pages. And the next question, does Fort Belvoir provide COVID antibody testing? And the answer to that one is not yet. We hope to in the future. Really experts across the nation are working hard to validate the tests that are currently available, but they're only available through research protocols. None of them have been approved by the FDA yet. Hopefully we'll get there soon. Um, is the PX Pharmacy still open? And the answer to that is yes. The PX Pharmacy is still processing electronic prescriptions from civilian providers as well as refills. They'll also fill new prescriptions that have been activated through the online secure messaging site. I know Commander Sprague covered a lot of those um, those opportunities on how to activate a prescription and you can still go to our webpage to see all of the opportunities to do that. Um, but yes, if you use the uh, secure messaging one, you can get your prescription uh, filled at the PX Pharmacy. 
if my prescription was processed to be picked up at the PX, do I still pick it up there? So that became a question when we opened the, um, the drive-through pharmacy. So because the PX pharmacy is still open, we did not move all of those prescriptions over to the drive-through process. They still remain available over at the PX, which I believe patients, the feedback that I get is that patients really like that because they can go to the commissary and then go by the PX and pick up those prescriptions. Um, I will tell you that the first thing in the morning continues to be the busiest time of day. It's better to wait a little bit later in the morning so that you're not waiting with the whole group that are trying to get there right at opening. Uh, has labor and delivery been asked to minimize staff going in and out of rooms? I think we talked about this a little bit last week, and the answer is, yeah, we try to balance that. We want to make sure that people, especially with the having to wear masks when there are staff in the room, we want to balance their um, having to wear that mask with their safety. So when it's safe to minimize people going in the room, we will do so, but we do not want to um, sacrifice safety just for the comfort of the mask. And I understand that that's a dissatisfier for folks, but we want to make sure that our patients are safe. Are there any online trainings or classes for first time moms? Right now, um, what we're doing, instead of doing all of those group classes, the prenatal classes and so on, is we're doing, we've turned those into individual classes. And uh, we're in the process of producing videos and, and virtual training for future use, but those are still in development. But to minimize any kind of group activity, those are being done on an individual basis until we can get those, those virtual opportunities up and running. Um, my number one question that I always get asked, are there confirmed cases of COVID on post? And the answer to that is yes. Um, but what I can tell you, since I can't give out the numbers, is that we remain um, consistent with what you're seeing in the local communities. Our numbers aren't any higher or any lower than what's in the local communities. We're very consistent when you look at it by age group. And we continue to report all of those numbers. So what you see in the, the local health department numbers and the CDC numbers, our numbers are in those. And if a patient tests positive for COVID-19 and works on the installation, are they required to receive a negative result after quarantine before returning to work? That seems to be the, the question of the week as, as some of those folks who have tested positive are now in the process of returning to work. There are two ways that we actually uh, release people from quarantine or have them return to work. One is a test-based methodology and one is a time-based methodology. Uh, the majority of people will discontinue quarantine using that time-based method. Um, it's the standard. It's been uh, they have to meet three criteria in order to be released. It has to have been three days since they had a fever, right? So fever-free for three days without taking any Tylenol or Motrin or any, any kind of medications that would um, reduce their fever. Their symptoms have to have improved, right? So if they had cough, difficulty breathing, shortness of breath or anything like that, those symptoms have to have improved. And then it has to have been at least seven days since the onset of symptoms. If they meet those three criteria, then um, they can be released from quarantine and return to work. If somebody didn't have any symptoms and they just had it, they were an asymptomatic person who tested positive because they were exposed to somebody to COVID, um, then instead of doing the seven, the, the seven days, they have to wait 10 days from that, that um, positive test in order to do so. The, the test-based method for returning people to work is they still have to meet those other criteria, right? They still have to be fever-free for at least three days and their symptoms have to have improved. But instead of doing seven to 10 days wait, they would have to have two tests that were negative within 24 hours of one another. So there are some communities, some commands, based on whatever the duties are or whatever the work environment may be, where some people would be required to have that test-based methodology. But like I said, the majority of them are gonna be that time-based methodology. That's my list of questions for today. All right. So I'm going to give some uh, some additional updates, and then I have a special guest that I'm going to bring up uh, to to talk uh, about our children and our children. So so first, uh, you've probably seen it, but DoD did announce the stop move extension to June 30th. Okay, they've also uh, put out over the last 48 hours that the Army is looking to incentivize our the do it do it yourself moves. Okay, don't know what that means yet, but as we get closer, uh, potentially next week or within the next couple weeks, when we get additional guidance on what that means, uh, we will put it out to the community at large. Uh, also, there was a question about child development centers uh, and just in general. Okay, so generally, we, we, are, we are taking vital only 
again, a step above the mission essential um, at this point. As we start rolling in, in the CDC or the, the Child Development Center employees are wearing all the prescribed pr protections, uh, children are wearing face coverings, we have complete social distancing, and we have done very well in the last couple weeks um, on enforcing and not having any incidents at the CDC. That's a good news story. Um, as, we, as we start to transition, um, again, we will not go from tens of children to 1,200 children. Okay, and so I, we will begin to put out more information uh, as we un unfold this. Uh, but again, you, I would expect that we would have a, a phasing approach uh, where we go from you know, the few that we have to potentially 25% capacity, um, up to 50% and then potentially up uh, higher than that. Um, but again, it, expectation management for those who have children in care, um, don't expect uh, to, that we're going to pull the trigger and put everyone back into care all at once uh, because, again, that's, that's not a recommended uh, implementation plan. Uh, two, we are still looking at barbershops. Uh, so Maryland did put out some guidance on barbershops uh, that, that they're going to follow. Uh, we have had public health assessments at our barbershops as well. Uh, we know what we need to do to protect our patrons uh, and, our, and our workers. Uh, and so we're, we're looking at over the next couple of weeks, again, I'm not going to give any date times yet, uh, of, of opening those uh, really to uh, active duty first. Um, and then as we transition uh, to the new norm, it will be expanded out further. Um, so again, I understand the concerns uh, with, with some folks on barbershops. And so we are looking at that and I will give you more information uh, over the next uh, one or two town halls. We are still doing uh, temperature readings uh, at both the commissary and the post exchange. Uh, there was a comment about why do I have to take my mask or my glasses off uh, or my hat off when we're doing those enhanced uh, temperature screenings or the passive temperature screenings. Um, again, that's the only way that we can get a core temperature. And so again, I understand the inconvenience uh, that you have, uh, but again, in order to get a a temperature reading, you have to take off your, your, your face covering uh, and your glasses and your hat. And so again, that will not change over the next couple of weeks. Okay, I'm gonna bring up my, uh, my special guest, uh, Jamie Albers. And so April, as Captain Judy said, April is the month of the military child. Um, and, we, and we are also at our 40th year anniversary across uh, the nation for child and youth services. Um, so in our current day, it's appropriate to recognize and applaud um, not just our children, but also CYS uh, during this, this uh, health crisis. Uh, this is a special time to applaud our military families and children. As Captain Judy said, you know, we, our families and our children sacrifice every day. Um, and, and the public doesn't really understand the two true challenges uh, that, our families, that, that our families have. Uh, the formal festivities for Month of the Military Child um, and the CYS 40th birthday is going to be tentatively uh, postponed uh, and it's rescheduled for September of 2020. So more to follow as we get closer to September, uh, but again, those festivities will go on uh, at that time. So Jamie is our school liaison officer. I thought it would be appropriate for her to just talk about some of the services um, that we're doing. And then also as the next school year is, is going to come upon us very, very soon, um, it's, it's really important for her to put out some uh, key information. So with that, Jamie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Colonel Greenberg. Um, my name is Jamie Albers. I'm the Fort Belvoir School Liaison Officers. And I work with the local school um, districts on your behalf to address school-related matters to support our military youth. My role is to serve as your liaison to help navigate through some of the challenges that our military students face during this mili military life and PCSing. So part of that is to inform and educate parents and school districts on the interstate compact on educational opportunities for military students. That compact covers a wide variety of challenges that military students have faced. All 50 states have adopted this, including the District of Columbia and all Department of Defense schools overseas. It covers such areas as credit transfers, on-time graduation, entrance age, uh, class repeats, and extracurricular activities. 
So as we enter this new normal, I thought it would be important to talk to you about some key issues that have an impact on military families and some resources that we can provide through our office. Just to let um, to state, the resources will be listed on the recap of this town hall and posted on the Belvoir and MWR Facebook. So the first question that I've had is regarding school registration. Can families uh, fill or register for school remotely? Um, all families are able to contact the school register remotely, even though schools are closed. So families will need to contact the school registrar and then the student will be added to the student information system and then at that time students can start registering for classes for next year. Once the buildings are reopened, the parents with the student will have to go to the school to sign all paperwork to finish registration. So for those families who are homeschooling on Fort Belvoir or choose to homeschool, uh, you will have to file an intent to homeschool with Fairfax County Public Schools. And our office can provide you with that document and also can provide you with the information and contact of the department you will need to send that paperwork to. We also support um, with homeschool through the Virginia Department of Education resources. And we can connect you with those as well. And we have a wonderful Fort Belvoir Homeschool Group, which partners with our MWR and CYS programs to support the Fort Bel Belvoir families' homeschools. Some of the um, available programs for military kids of all ages, and one I want to talk about uh, specifically. Several schools within our Fairfax County Public Schools have military family life consultants, counselors. And in response to the school closings, they are offering individual video non-medical counseling sessions for minors ages 13 to 17. Parent or, parent or guardian must be available at the start of each video session to give parental consent and then must be within line of sight. They are also doing family video non-counseling for minors 6 to 12 years of age and parenting, parents or guardians must attend the sessions full time. They are HIPAA compliant and I have had um, many families contact me stating that this has been a wonderful service. Um, it's been very helpful for their children, especially during this time when schools were closing and they didn't have a chance to say goodbye to teachers or uh, friends. Um, so it's a very valuable resource that um, I recommend to all families to utilize. Um, we also have uh, tutor.com, which is a 24 hour, seven day a week um, online tutoring service. Um, you can get on and get immediate tutoring, um, or you can schedule times to um, have your child work with a, a teacher on tutoring. And they have 100 different um, subjects, and they have uh, teachers that are uh, certified, and they can get on and help with array of uh, subjects for your students. And also, they can help do with college prep, which uh, with college essays, they can do SAT preps, they can also help uh, resume writing. So they have a wide variety of services. And the US Department of Defense and the military community and family policy has temporarily expanded eligibility for tutor.com. So it's now available at no cost for any adult or child in a DOD civilian or active duty National Guard, Reserve, or Wounded Warrior military family who is trying to continue learning while managing unexpected changes to their routines. So we also have another great resource for those families who have children that are uh, getting ready to take their AP exams. So the College Board has uh, um, online teachers, AP teachers, that can help tutor uh, your child in um, preparing them to take the AP exam. They have live or they have recorded sessions um, that can help with your students. And the College Board testing is going to be for AP is 11 through 22 May. So we will have all that information on how to get on to that system to get um, assistant for the AP classes. Um, we also provide uh, scholarship information and we will have that on our MWR and our CYS Facebook. So now more than ever, we need to take advantage of resources and programs that we have provided for us to ensure your children are able to thrive as they go back to their new learning environment. So I continue, I encourage parents to use me as a resource 
We're all in this together to continue to make 2020 school year a success. If you need to contact me, my number is 703-805-3436. Again, that's 703-805-3436. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jamie, very much. And thank you for what you do for our community. It's really important. Okay, with that, I am going to, uh, I have my subject matter experts here as well, uh, some of the task force leads. And so I am going to bring them up and answer some of your questions. Uh, I'm going to start with the Director of Emergency Services. Thanks, sir. Um, I'm Frank Henschel, the Director of Emergency Services, and I'll start with uh, some installation access uh, questions. First question we received is, can you change Pence Gate's flashing sign to say, visitors go to Tully? Answer, yes. Great idea, and we've already done it. I received your question yesterday, so uh, I got ahead of that one. Next question, Tully Gate is terrible at night. Can there be more lighting or adequate lights? The road, the road also needs repaving and the lane, the lane lines are rubbed all the way out. Not safe. Answer, after receiving this question also, last night we conducted a lighting survey at the Tully Gate area. Pohick Road leading up to Tully Gate area is a low light area. Primary reason for that is it is adjacent to the Akatink Wildlife Refuge. Additionally, after the survey, we made some lighting adjustments and we will continue to make some improvements. Third question, how, how do you enforce social distancing on people that live in housing? Well, first of all, as the garrison commander mentioned, if you see something, say something. Second of all, fortunately, we've not had to use law enforcement for social distancing. We ask that you continue to self-distance and stay safe. Final question, can't reach the visitor center. The line is always busy. I need to know if they're still allowing moving vans to come on base for my civilian move out. Please advise, thanks. Answer, moving vans are allowed on the installation. They must come through they must come through the, the Tully Gate entrance commercial visitor lane to be processed. The second part of that question though, the visitor center is temporarily closed and visitors are being processed in their vehicle to reduce personal interaction. Sir, that's all I have. All right, thank you, Frank. All right, as Mr. Rennick comes up to answer the DHR question, I'm gonna answer a couple questions uh, myself. Uh, so this one was for the commissary. Can you ask the, can you please show workers how to wear their, their face coverings? Um, again, uh, I think it may not be the, the perspective that they don't know how to wear them. Uh, again, what we're asking our supervisors across AP's commissary and other agencies out there is to give, your, give the employees a little bit of time uh, to take the masks off and give their face uh, a minute to breathe. Uh, if you if you wear the masks, and I know many have gone into the commissary or just done some shopping, and you keep the mask, the, the face coverings on for about an hour or two, you know how it feels. Um, and so uh, again, that's how we are going to uh, try to help out uh, with enforcing those uh, that standard. The the other question was, you know, why I think I addressed already. Uh, you know, why do why do you have to remove your face mask and and glasses? for thermal scanners, I've already answered that question. Uh, the other one was how many people are allowed in the commissary at one time. Again, I'm not gonna give you an exact number. Um, all I'll tell you is it, we are limited access. Again, the morning hours are more busy than the afternoon hours. Uh, we, we do have monitors going into the commissary along with the store managers um, to, to monitor to make sure that we are not letting too many people in uh, where they are, they are corralling in one of the high, high volume uh, aisles, uh, but again, there is some limited uh, numbers going into the commissary, especially in the morning. I think we answered the uh, the education one about uh, enrolling digitally. Jamie answered that one, uh, and then I'll let uh, Kevin go ahead with the DHR question. 
Good afternoon all again. Kevin Rennick, Director of Human Resources. Question, timeline for soldiers who have a report date after stop movement to receive orders. Great question. I want you all to know that orders are being pushed out. Orders are being pushed out daily. I ask that all soldiers please coordinate with your unit S1, your G1, or your administrative coordinator. We are corresponding via t uh, email. We are corresponding telephonically to ensure that all soldier actions and orders are being disseminated accordingly. The other question that came up, which is not necessarily in the Director of Human Resources, but aligns with your PCS moves, and that has to do with household goods, the shipments, and understanding under the stop movement the impact this may have to getting appointments. Again, Colonel Greenberg has spoke, spoken to you or alluded to the fact that the Army is aware of the situation. They are looking at means and try to help assist and accommodate with your logistic movement. But I ask that you also reach out to the local Joint Personnel Property Shipping Office, for they are the subject matter expert on all transportation and household good movements. Thank you. All right, one question for uh, FMWR. You have more than one question, just the one. So I'll answer that question uh, for you because we don't have an answer yet, okay? And so the question was, any thoughts about reopening the golf course uh, with safe distancing requirements? Yes, we thought about safe distancing requirements. No, we haven't thought of a date yet. And so uh, again, like, like the other activities on the installation, uh, golf as you knew it a couple months ago is not gonna be what it will look like as we open up. Um, and I'll use golf as an example. You know, potentially it could be that um, that each per that it's one limited one person per golf course or per golf cart um, for the time being until we start to lower uh, lower the HP con levels um, and so again we have discussed that that will probably be one of the new changes as we open the golf course uh, but also an example of of different activities of what the new norm will look like uh, as we open those up. Okay, do we have any questions from out in the audience? Yes, sir. Can we go for a run without the mask as long as we are able to remain six to eight feet away from others? Yes, yeah, so the, the question was, can you, uh, can you run without a mask as long as you can stay uh, away from others? And the answer is yes. Uh, and I know there's families out there that are running with their children, you know, and I've seen them and they're not running with face coverings. That's fine as well, again, uh, if you can maintain the, the distances, uh, that is, there's no issues. Are children under the age of 16 required to show their ID when entering post? Yes. Uh, and between 16, go ahead, Frank. 17 and below. Sir. 17 and below yes, are required, correct. Okay, and then there was questions about real ID. I think we answered last time, yes, correct? Okay, any other questions out there? Okay, so hopefully this was, uh, this was informed. Kemp, do you have any questions um, actually, that you, that you wanna answer? Things, yeah, there were a couple from, I think last week, I just wanted to, okay. uh, to do real quick. One of them was, um, are people with autoimmune diseases still able to refill prescriptions for hydroxychloroquine at the pharmacy? And the answer is yes, we have plenty uh, to continue to refill those prescriptions as needed for people who are already taking that. Um, and then there was another question about can the hospital uh, pharmacy refill prescriptions now? So there's a lot of discussion about getting your refills, whether you get them at the PX pharmacy or at the main um, pharmacy. And so uh, with the drive up service right now, if somebody wants to, to refill um, a prescription, they can do that by activating it first or doing the drive up on the first deck and then the pickup on the second deck. So. Those are the two that I have. All right, and then any closing comments? Nope, I am good. Thanks, sir. Okay, so so first I want to thank. I didn't do it up front, but I'm gonna do it uh, in the in the rear today. So so thank you to all our employees out there, from the hospital staff uh, to our first responders, CDC, police, fire, emergency services, uh, housing, IHG, APs, commissary, and all the others out there um, that are maintaining facilities, maintaining this installation and they're coming to work to really support the installation. Thank you, thank you for what you're doing every day uh, because without you, this installation 
uh, couldn't, couldn't remain operational uh, and mission ready. Uh, and two, thank you for everyone who's participating in these town halls. Uh, hopefully they are productive. I know we put a polling question out. Um, apologize to those few that said this was ineffective or you didn't get any value out of it. Um, again, if, if you want to provide some uh, feedback to our public affairs office, uh, we're, we're more than happy to take it. But again, um, I feel, and I think Captain Judy feels, that this forum um, is uh, educational or allows us to push that information out as we get it, uh, to be transparent uh, with you, with effective communication, um, and then really to answer all those questions or concerns that you have. Um, so we will continue to do this weekly. Unless something changes between a Thursday to a Thursday, uh, then we will do this again next Thursday at 5 p.m. Um, again, you can find the recap and the videos of all the town halls on our website and on the Facebook video pages. Uh, continue to use, we will continue to use um, all our media platforms, not just Facebook, but Twitter and Instagram, and then also our website uh, as resources uh, for you to get the latest information. Please stay safe. Thank you for listening. Uh, we look forward to the next update. Again, remember, we're all in this together. The longer we stay at home and apart, the sooner we'll be together. Thank you.